Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco from the KnifeJunkie.com. Welcome. Welcome to session number eight of the Knife Junkie podcast and a special one at that. We have a guest interview on the show this time. Indeed, our first guest interview. It's with Ian Lewis, a a, a friend and respected martial artist. Oh, looking forward to that. But first, before we get to the interview, folks know we always have to do our pocket check and I'll spoil it for you, Bob. I'm going (laughs) to go ahead and let you know. Okay. I I still have my buck canoe and my knife as a new. As listeners know, a couple of weeks back, you put out six knives on the table and said, Jim, you got to pick one and you're going to leave here with it. And you're going to not carry your Swiss Army knife for a couple of weeks. I haven't. I'm missing right. the toothpick, I must admit. The toothpick, but yeah. Yeah, but I'm loving the Buck Canoe. It's it's a great size. I love the uh, the aesthetics of it. It's just a great looking, awesome looking knife. And I've used it uh, several times this week. Had a, a family trip up to New York. Had to open a few things and we got back. Had a few Amazon packages and boxes. So been using the Buck Canoe and still like it. That's great. That's great. It's amazing uh, how resourceful people think you are when you pull out a simple pocket knife to open up a package and uh, relieve them of the stress of figuring out how to do it. Yeah, use their fingernail. I have to find scissors. I was like, here, I I can help with that. What are you, some sort of an animal? (laughs) Yeah. So what's in your pocket, Bob? I know one of them. I know it's going to be the uh, uh, cold steel broken skull, the pink handle. That's always a normal third knife that you have. Indeed, it's on me because I'm expecting to leave the man cave at some point today. But since I am in the man cave today, I'm carrying my large, uh, extra large cold steel recon one Bowie knife. And uh, it's in CTS XHP steel. It's just amazing. It's a super broad blade. It's a thin blade and it's fully flat ground. So by the time you get to the edge, it is super thin behind the edge. It is a slicing beast and just a beautiful, beautifully made knife. And then in my left pocket today, I'm carrying my case uh, trapper, classic full size trapper with the yellow Delrin handles and the CV. That's the chrome vanadium steel. That's a high carbon steel. And I have a beautiful uh, patina on it. And uh, All right. so, yeah, I'm hoping a steak comes my way today and I get to cut it up. That sounds awesome. Let me know what time I'll be there. <laughs> All right. And <laughs> and as you know, we do have a guest today. It's Ian Lewis, and he is also a knife carrier on a daily basis. Ian, welcome. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure having you on the Knife Junkie podcast. So tell me what you're carrying today. So today I have a uh, Bastinelli Knives red folder, as you can see. Oh, yeah. Um, has about a three and a half inch blade, and uh, I have a custom grind on it from uh, Mr. Bastinelli himself. Um, I visited his shop in Florida and he put a little custom grind on it for me. Nice. And, um, very, very fast deploying, very smooth, a uh, very comfortable grip. You'll never be parting with this one. You'll never be selling this. To I'll get never be one. selling this one. Yeah. It was a very, very special day when I picked this one up. So this um, is in the, t- Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'll get, th- we'll get into some of that yeah, actually yeah. when we talk in just a minute, but this knife is amazing. This is the first, uh, uh I think this is a lion steel made, uh, Italian yes, lion steel. folder and, it's beautiful. This is the first lion steel I've ever held. And uh, the ball bearings, the action, everything about it. This is gorgeous. Tell, tell everyone what red stands for. So the red stands for Raptor Extremely Dangerous. Um, the folding <laughs> subtle. knife is... Yeah, <laughs> subtle. And the folding knife is actually based off of a uh, fixed blade red model, which uh, came out beforehand. And wasn't that made for a movie? Didn't that go into one of the... Uh, Movies with uh, Mila Kun- or Mila Jovovich jumping around, slicing uh, yeah, people. Yeah, and... Um, Yes, and uh, Scarlett Johansson as well oh, oh, had oh, yeah. Bastinelli knives in it as well. Um, it wasn't the red. I'm trying to remember the name at the moment. It's slipping my mind. Nice. Um, but yes, that, they've been used in, in films as well, well. I got my eyes on you too, Bob, making yeah. sure that he gets that knife back. Oh, oh, oh okay. Uh, well, okay. Well, geez. <laughs> If you have to, right? He can take it back from me. If he, right, right. <laughs> he's got, he would have no problem doing that, Jim. Right. So actually, since we're here and we're talking about knives and we're holding knives and uh, let, let's just get right into it. Uh, have you always been a knife guy, Ian? I have. I've been a knife guy my, my whole life. I got my, my first K-Bar heavy Bowie knife when I was about 13 years old. Nice. The heavy Bowie, that, that was the one that they made uh, in the late 90s that has the saw teeth on it. And it's about uh, an 11 inch blade. Yes. It's really brought that as a bad knife. I yes. Love that. Uh, yeah. I was really into, uh, 
outdoor wilderness survival and I used it for, um, I didn't have the, the martial aspect yet, but I used it for, uh, you know, whittling, splitting firewood, all that kind of type of thing. So um, actually, tell me a little bit about your training. Tell me all about your training. You've been training for seven years and I feel like uh, I uh, I was in on the, on the beginning of it. I met you early on in your training. Yes. Tell me who you've trained under and what your certifications are. So I started training when I was nine years old in Taekwondo in uh, Falls Church, Virginia. And I, uh, I got out of that. I always loved martial arts when I was um, a kid. And uh, I don't remember why I stopped training. And then it wasn't until after high school when I found the Fighters Garage in Falls Church. And um, if you'd like, I can tell you the background story about why I actually got into training. Yeah, please. Um, so me and my brothers were in England one year. And uh, we were attacked by uh, what the police thought to be a London gang that came in uh, to the coast for a weekend. And we were attacked by them. We were outnumbered. It was about 30 to 3 oh my God. people. And um, basically that, it changed me a little bit, kind of opened me up to a little more real world experience. And um, when I got home, I, I wanted to do something about it. And so I, I signed up for Krav Maga and Krav Maga kind of led me into finding other martial arts like Filipino martial arts Kali, which then became a passion of mine. And that kind of opened the door to uh, training in several systems and moving on to a lot of different instructors. So before we get to that, what did that uh, what did that occurrence in England look like? You were chased by 30 people. Did you have to fight your way out? What happened? Yeah, so uh, we were on the coast at night. Um, there was a closed cafe, and basically uh, there were groups of people spread it out. And uh, one of them had a tone with my brother, and me being the immature 18-year-old I was, I said something, and all mm. of them got up, and I didn't know they were buddies. Oh. And uh, they all uh, basically attacked us, and then it was just, you know, right off the bat, wild. They attacked us, you know adrenaline dump, all that kind of thing, you know, chaos, you know, a bunch of people surrounding us running around. They blocked off the street. Uh, there was definitely, there was definitely wow. some fighting involved. Um, yes. So, uh, I know a lot of people, myself included at, at different times in my life have felt like, well, my righteous indignation and my rage and my strength and whatever experience I have would get me out of a tight bind if need be. In this situation, did you think, uh, did you feel like uh, not having martial arts training? I mean, did you feel your lack of training in that situation? I did. And um, and I think the important thing, though, also is to know when to use your training and when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate. OK. Um, yes. Yeah. OK. So, so I've, let, let, let's uh, let's get to the brass tacks here. We're talking about knife fighting in the age of the gun. And I'm going to just say I'm going to use the term uh, I'm going to use the term knife fighting as a generic term for all sorts of uh, martial or tactical applications with a knife. Just as shorthand, we'll use knife fighting. I know it's kind of an outdated term or whatever, but let's just say that. So why is it worth training in knives and knife combatives in the age of the gun? Okay, so I look at it this way. And when I look at a gun, I look at most people, and I'm, 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 I'm saying this generally speaking, who say, oh, I'll just shoot you when you're talking about knives or really any type of close quarter combatives work is one, we also learn to use guns as well. I think every full, fully competent martial artist or combatives um, person must know all the weapons. If you don't know modern weapons in a modern era, it, it could potentially have problems. But on the other hand, for all the knife lovers out there, training is very, very important. And I think it's so easy to say, I'll just shoot you or I'll just pull out my gun when when the reality is there are there's a lot of couch potatoes out there saying that, carrying their firearms. And um, I think they don't practice what they preach because it's so easy to just carry a gun and think that you're safe. Right. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we have the 20 foot rule with the knife closing. What's the, the what's the 20 foot rule with the knife? So so the 20 foot rule is basically how fast a would be knife attacker can close the distance on someone with their ability to draw the gun. And okay. uh, they found that within 20 feet, um, a lot of the times the person with the knife can enter in on the person and um, and finish the fight, so to speak, before they can access their weapon. And that comes to. And that is usually due to training and changing the line. So if if someone is attacking me with my, with a gun and they're attacking me straight on, I need to change my line. 
I need to ch- move off the 45 right. and change my angle. I can't go straight back because they're going to beat me to it. And then, and of course, practicing these, these uh, skill sets is very important because if you don't practice, if you don't practice the skill set and you just have the tool, the tool will do you no good. You're the weapon, not the tool. So for all the people out there, you know, I don't care how big your knife is. I want to see what you can do with your knife. And uh, same could be said about the gun. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody can put a, a gun on their hip and, and look a little potentially scary. And I'm not saying that if you're untrained with a knife or a gun, you're less than less dangerous because we all know how unpredictable a knife can be and um, how even an untrained adversary is extremely dangerous with a knife, especially when you're talking about empty hand versus knife. So, OK, this this brings me to the idea of self-perfection versus self-preservation. Tell me what is training for self-perfection and tell me what is training for self-preservation. So my teacher, Sifu Paul Vunak, who is a Calif- pretty famous California-based martial artist, he's under Guru Dan Asano, um, who was Bruce Lee's protege. Mm-hmm. Um, he explained self-preservation and self-perfection to me as follows. Self-perfection is what you do to develop your attributes, your distance, your timing, your line familiarization, and your footwork. And, and uh, because we're talking about knives, this is with weapons. This could be with any martial art. Mm-hmm. So it's all the drills, it's all the attributes, it's all the disarms and all all the fun attributes that develop. Flow drills. Yeah, flow and- drill, your speed, timing, and all that kind of fun stuff. And then self-preservation is what you do in the fight. That's what you do to protect your family. And when we talk about knives, the most basic term we use and that we teach everyone first is called defanging the snake. And basically what defanging the snake is, is I'm cutting the weapon hand or smashing the weapon hand, depending on if you're talking about an edge or impact weapon. So if I was to aim at your head to cut your head, you would simply back away and cut my hand, thus disarming the knife defanging the snake right as the filipinos call it and then it's your choice you can either follow up or or leave so that's um that's that's up to you so you talk about paul vunak a legend in uh as a street fighter who who basically um over years of trial and error and gaining empirical evidence out in the street uh developed a a sort of uh, system or uh, boiled down the essence of jeet kune do into some very um you know, headbutts, knees and elbows and some very uh, basic and uh, direct ways of brutally uh, stopping an attack. But I also know that he does a lot of the flow drills and the training to develop attributes. What about uh, Guru Danny Nosanto or Fred Mastro? Who you're, tell me about your certifications and your experience with them and how um, they approach this idea of self-perfection and self-preservation. So um, my teacher, Sebastian Vandenberg, which is the, the head instructor of Mastro Defense System for the USA. Who, who's Fred Mastro? So Fred Mastro is a, um, is a martial artist, uh, head of the Mastro Defense System, which is a European-based system. And it basically incorporates several, several different martial arts. Um, together as one, almost in a Jeet Kune Do esque fashion. Okay, you'll and, know you'll know him from his fight choreography in the movie Taken. Yes. If you've ever seen that great movie with Liam Neeson getting his daughter back, the first movie, <laughs> the first one, and yes. kicks kicking ass all across yes. Eastern Europe and, and Paris. Yes, it's and, a very direct um, style of fighting, right? Yes, it's it's very direct. Um, a lot of it comes from Sea Lot, but is is adapted because what he does is he takes the traditional aspect. And uh, through his many years of uh, VIP protection and bouncing and street experience in uh, France and Belgium, he has uh, developed his own system from lessons that he's learned in the street. So very much like Paul Vunak, I attract teachers who have really used the skill so that when I teach to my students and I talk to people about it, they know that, that that what they're getting is real because I'm just the conduit to it. It's proven. Yes. So back to Sebastian. So um, Sebastian is uh, Fred Mastro's top student. He's the uh, head instructor for the USA. He's been with them 20 odd years. And um, he is my direct teacher. And uh, Fred Mastro is also one of my teachers as well. And uh, I've been training with them for about two years. And um, the system blended very well with what I learned from uh, my teacher, Dan Asano and Paul Lunak. Um, because uh, their philosophies are the same uh, in terms of self-perfection and self-preservation. Although I haven't heard Fred or Sebastian use those terms, mm-hmm. they have the drills to develop your qualities. And then also they have, you know, the practical application, what, you know, what really works. You know, a lot of times you'll see in Filipino martial arts, we make seven cuts on someone after one move. Right. <laughs> um, this is for flow development and attribute training. But really, there were three people there. 
or there were however many people there. So the techniques will be a lot more direct and a lot more efficient in the so-called practical application, which will not turn out to be as fancy right. as what you would see us doing in, let's say, a group class. So when you teach a class, when you're teaching, taking on a new student, I know you, you do a lot of privates. Um, when you take on a private student, how do you approach uh, the balance of self-perfection and self-preservation? Right. So it depends on what the student is looking for and the amount of time that I'll have that I have with the student. So if I need to take someone to zero to 60 in a matter of days in terms of a combative standpoint, then what I would be teaching them is uh, rapid assault tactics from Paul Bunek, which is the system that he taught to the Navy SEALs. Okay, okay, wait, wait. So, so if you have to get someone trained up super quickly, yes, you'll teach them the rat. Um, that's a lot of folks who, who don't know. That's a lot of headbutts, knees, elbows, entering, and eye gouging, and and uh, very close fighting. Yes. if I could boil it down. Uh, but why? <laughs> I mean, you pique my curiosity. Under what circumstances would you have to? Uh, under what circumstances would you have to train someone up in? six weeks to be an ass kicker? Well, so it, it really depends. I have a, I have a student who is, um, he's in the state department uh -huh. and he had limited time to train with me and he did about 10 sessions. And, uh, that's exactly what I did. I, I, I taught him how to, um, enter with nerve destructions, which is, comes from the Filipino martial arts and, uh, a straight blast, which is uh, Wing Chun called the Jik Chun Choi. And, uh, and then to get to the neck and apply headbutt knees and elbows, which are going to take out a bigger, a bigger, a larger opponent. If you look at your head, it's a 15 pound fist, you know? So, yeah. um, if you slam the top of your head into someone's face and drive your knee into their <laughs> groin, oh, this is very efficient. Dude, I like that. A 15 pound fist. Never thought of it that way. Uh, so two questions. Well, I have many. Okay. What, realistically speaking, what would a knife engagement, I'm not even going to call it a knife fight right now because a knife fight seems to me almost like an anomaly. So what does it look like when two people go at each other with athletic intent with blades? It sounds like both people die. Who, who wins in a knife fight? So my teacher, Paul Vunak, calls that headhunters. And basically what that means from a lot of uh, prison video uh, uh, surveillance footage that um, he studied and that he's gathered from F FBI uh, stats and law enforcement is that basically any type of most untrained people are what we call headhunters. They'll be just viciously aiming at each other's head. And what that basically, when you have, two, uh, when you're looking at a knife on knife attack, ends up in both people dying or both people being severely wounded because you're trading blows. You can't trade blows with an edge weapon. And this this goes back to the concept of defang in the snake. I need to keep that range. And as he comes in and attacks me, I'm de quote unquote defanging the snake, disarming. The disarm is my cut on the hand, which will which will uh, disarm the knife. Okay. So knowing that, okay, just uh, having trained with you and having learned a lot of stuff from you, and, uh, you know, I, I know pretty well, uh, at least, you know, what you're capable of. A lot of it has to do with, uh, in a hypothetical engagement, things are trained out of hypothetical engagements. But my, my point is, I know that you're pretty, pretty damn good at, at what you do. And I know that you walk around carrying a knife under what circumstances. I mean, I feel like when you train as much as you do, things are going to happen automatically. It's like, it's like an enter the dragon. Uh, when the time comes, I don't punch. My fist punches all by itself. And right. I would imagine you would face the same dilemma in the street. So what, what, what kind of system have you worked out, uh, morally or, or ethically to, uh, determine when you would use a knife in a, right. in a confrontation? Right. So, um, so for me, my knife would be used to first protect my family. I, I'm not a, uh, I'm a, I'm not a gun user, at least at this point in my life, but I, I always carry a knife. So the first one would be to protect my family, uh, someone on drugs or someone who I feel uh, needs to be taken care of, so to speak, who is going to um, harm a family member or a loved one. And the second one is, is fear for my own life. So I'm by myself and um, I don't wait to see until something happens. If I feel my life threatened or I see that he has a weapon and he is not responding to you know, when I'm telling him to back off since so-and-so, yeah. then I will, I don't wait to engage if I know his intentions because we train to wait and to have all these techniques off of all these different angles. But the reality is, is in, in the street, you're not going to know what they're going to attack you with. 
So, you know, the, the, there are techniques that work. There are more probabilities of if he's right-handed and the most common ways people attack people. That's all legit. We teach uh, techniques to deal with those. Mm -hmm. But um, if you feel your life is in danger, whether it's um, empty hand, the person's bigger to you, or it's a knife altercation, I highly suggest that you strike first and you strike hard and then it's vicious. Roger that. Okay. Well, that sounds like a... Because he won't show you the same level of respect. So this is... Uh this is where it comes to the individual. I can't, when I teach, we don't teach when to do certain things. Mm. I can just advise you, right? But it's, it's up to the individual. I'm just telling you my personal preference. If I feel that my life is in danger, I don't wait. And, um, as my, uh, as my teacher, Fred Master says, one of my favorite courts is, is that they say in Italy, I'd rather talk to the judge than talk to the worms. <laughs> talk to them. That's great. So, okay, knowing all that, that means you got to have a knife in your pocket. So what would you what would you say to people who are out there who are thinking uh, they might want to get into collecting knives or buying knives for a more tactical uh, use? Uh, maybe this, these are people who are training and and uh, I mean, would you would you give any advice on what kind of knife to get or uh, what's your idea about that? So I think the, the first thing that, that you need to address is before the type of blade or the style of blade is what. First of all, what state or area do you live in? You got to take in the laws. Yes. Uh, are you are you carrying a fixed blade? Are you carrying a folder? And and I'm going to tell you why that's important because the the way that you deploy the weapon is going to be different, and that needs to be a trained response. So if you're carrying a fixed blade, you know your whole life, and you switch to a folder, and it's your first week, and something happens, and you go for that fixed blade draw, and it's not there. Right. Right. So it depends on your state and what's legal and what's not. And what I would also recommend is finding someone in your area that you can train edge weapons tactics in and practice deploying your knife, but not focusing on the knife too much. And um, I'll give you a quick example of that. If I feel that I'm threatened and someone is within, let's say, 10 feet of me, uh -huh. it's e and I know they have a weapon, it's easy for me or someone to focus on getting my weapon out. But I don't want to take, I don't want to let that adrenaline rush have me only focus on my knife and looking down, tr fi uh, trigger, finding how to get it out. Yeah. And then having him come in and, and do whatever he's going to do to me. So, um, and that goes back to your point when you were saying uh, knife fighting or knife dueling. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we knife duel and let's say progressive fighting systems, Paul B. Next system, we train to cut the hand. We'll put boxing gloves on and we'll have aluminum training knives mm -hmm. and we spar and it looks like kind of fencing. We're dueling. Yeah. This is for attribute development. It's not to say that this couldn't happen. Right. But it's very, it's unlikely when usually when, um, when someone is committed to attack you with a knife, they're not moving around poking at you all different angles. It's a, it's a committed attack to come in and, you right. know, take your head off with a slash or a thrust to the abdomen. And, um, and you need the ability to deal with that. And, if you're focusing on getting your knife out as that attack is coming in, he's going to beat you every time. Yeah. So we look at ways to um, stop the power of the knife attack, empty hands, or to guide it off and to injure him and create space to then get your weapon out to do what you need to do. So basically, uh, that, just to sum that up, you're you're going to want to carry every day the kind of knife you're going to train with. Something that you're... If possible. Right. Yes. If, if you're carrying a knife for self-protection for, for any reason, you're going to want to be con somewhat consistent so that if you actually have to draw that knife in the heat of the moment, you'll, you'll, m your muscle memory will kick in and you'll be able to be effective. I, I want to actually point people to, uh, the knife junkie.com slash zero seven. It's the, it's our seventh podcast where we, it's actually a, a, a buying guide mm -hmm. for different kind of knives that I've used, um, and that I personally vouch for. And, and as you know, my taste when I'm not carrying grandpa knives, my taste veer veer towards the gnarly veer towards the tactical and so there are a lot of those on that buying list um, yes but, but you know and I'll, I'll bring that point up too i know um you're also a uh, a lifelong martial artist and um yes. and and you know carrying knives and and you have all a knife you're a knife collector and you you will, will have a lot more experience just being around them than say somebody new so right. if you're looking, and there are, are a lot of self-defense options, um, but if you are choosing to go with a knife, I recommend a trainer that goes with it if possible. Uh, one of my favorites is the Spyderco Endura 4. Yep, you've been um, carrying that a long time. But the that, that was my first tactical knife, and um, I had the fully serrated edge. 
and they're ne- they now have a aluminum trainer for the same cost. It's about seventy eighty dollars. Nice, and um, that comes with it. And so you'll have that same feel of taking it out of your pocket and deploying it when you're training, and you know that you have that same feel when if or when you had to use it in the fight, which is which is very very um, important to me if you're seriously talking about self defense use. Because there's a lot of people who will do, let's say, kali, which mm-hmm. is a Filipino martial art, yep. and they'll do it just for the love of the art. And it I, feels good to do. It feels good. I love the art. I've been, um, I've trained with, um, literally some of the best, uh, Filipino martial artists Danny on Nassanto, the planet. I've Paul with Vunak. Paul Vunak, Grand Tuhan Leo Gahe, is who is head of the, uh, head of uh, the Kali system and, uh, yeah, yes, Pekiti Tersha. And, um, and his nephew, what was his yeah, name? Yeah, uh, Tuhan Meltwortal. Oh, yeah, Meltwortal yeah. came back. And uh, so with Karambit and Straight Blade, and I've done multiple seminars. Oh, and I got to ask you yes. about the Karambit. I mean, if you can rewind maybe eight years when the Karambit first came on the scene, it seemed like people thought that it was the magic elixir. If you can just get a Karambit in your hands, you are just going to be the baddest mofo on the street. And I'll grant you that the finger ring does does aid in retention. And that little hooked sickle blade coming out like a claw is very intuitive. But let me ask you, do you think that the Karambit itself is the wonder blade, the do-all uh, tactical blade? I I don't. And I love the Karambit. I have an Emerson Combat Karambit myself, and I have the trainer to go with it. Um, I do carry it. I It's not that well, I think as a utilitarian knife, the straight blade is a little bit more useful. Um, some people might disagree with me because of the hawk style, hawk bill style blade. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that really at the end of the day, it's what are you comfortable with? And um, the idea behind you're the baddest dude because you have a certain knife to me can get you in a lot of trouble. And and I'll I'll uh, I'll try to give you a, everybody a good example. If I have a karambit, let's say because we're talking about that. And I feel threatened and I brandish my knife to someone, let's say to scare them off. And it's got that shiny uh, silver looking blade, blade, you know, and it glistens and everything. Um, and you're hoping to scare off a would be attacker. I'm not saying this isn't going to scare somebody, but you're not going to pull out a karambit at a, a bar at a college bar fight or right. or, you know, some, you know, somebody's just drunk, you know, a buddy of yours and, and you're fighting. And this is something that you're going to pull out against a guy who you really feel, you know, there's that look in his eye that he's like, he's not just wanting your wallet. He wants your life. Right. Right. So the idea of brand, of letting them know that I even have a knife is completely foolish. Yeah. Knives are meant to be felt, not seen. Oh, as a uh, as a uh, Doug Markaida, that's one of Doug Markaida, um, um, one of his little guru Doug Markaida, one yeah. of his maxims. Well, I, I think that's a great uh, that's a great line to wrap up on. It, say that again for me. Yeah. Uh, knives are meant to be felt, not seen. Knives are meant to be felt, not seen. And of course, we're speaking in a life saving tactical uh, uh, situation, of course. Uh, but that's a that's a nice little bit of wisdom to end on from Doug Markaida. But uh, before we do end, I want to ask you, well, I know I'm making you a Bowie knife as a, a an appreciation gift. And it's something that uh, I know you're lately you've been digging the Bowie knife. Yes. So you got that in the offing. But what about for Christmas? What are you going to ask for for Christmas? What's your what's your Christmas knife this year? I'm looking to get a uh, Pika Karambit by Bastinelli Knives. I trained when I went up to New York and uh, this op- October with Fred Master on Doug Markaida. We actually got aluminum trainers that uh, are available with a custom wrap handle. And it's a, it's a very small Karambit. It's, it's a, traditionally Karambits are a very, very small blade. They're, they're not meant to be seen in the hand. It's kind of one of those knives you feel it and it's over, so to speak, in, in a wartime application or self-protection in your life. Right. And so it kind of goes back to that that traditional feel and the way that you can carry it. Yeah. And very good in close quarter grappling situations where um, they won't see it. And it's a it, it's something I would recommend actually for any woman to carry or man. Okay. It's a very small blade, but a very vicious blade. Yes. It's, yes, a, I- it's a scalpel-esque yeah. sharpness, you know, with a, with a small curve it's a and it's very 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 nice <laughs> i've seen those custom uh ones of the yes. custom wrap handles uh with the little medallion underneath uh on instagram yes. on bastinelli's uh, instagram page and i know that doug markaida's were uh, doug markaida wears the pika karambit sometimes on forged in fire i'm always checking out what the guy what the judges on forged in fire are carrying yep. and uh, he's always got something like that well anyway ian i want to thank you so much for coming by and talking to me about this stuff i think it's important that uh we address you know it 
as knife collectors, we get excited about the tool itself, but we have to remember that the tool gets used for all sorts of things. And one of those things uh, is inevitably going to be tactical and self-defense. So I, I think it's a, an interesting thing to talk about. I obviously think it's an interesting thing to train. It, it makes the body feel good. It's also nice to know that your exercise is uh, is of practical value. Yes, and and of course, us as uh, knife collectors and lover out there, there's that fun aspect too, which is very important. You know, like I tell my students, um, and remind myself, so to speak, because of some experiences I've I've had in the past in terms of self defense. You know, sometimes you get caught up too much in um, the reality of training and what you may or may not have to do. But don't forget to have fun with it and enjoy your training, uh, because if you're not enjoying it, then you won't come back. So yeah, that's, uh, that's some advice that I'll have. Uh, make it fun. Don't take it too seriously in the, in the sense that you never enjoy it because enjoying it is a, is a very important part of it, I think. All right. Well, thank you, Ian. Jim, uh, you ever, ever know that there are so many different things to consider uh, when it comes to knife combatives and <laughs> the tactical aspects? No, no, I did not. And <laughs> I'm definitely not going to be messing with Ian. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, sometime soon you have to come by and uh, Ian will lead me through some drills and you got to see some of the stuff he does because it's it's amazing. Uh, the, Maybe we'll catch up, catch that on video and put it up on the knifejunkie.com. We will. We will. If, <laughs> if, if, he, if he says we can put that video up there, we'll do that. Um, and you really, really get to see how beautiful the self uh, perfection stuff is and how scary the self preservation stuff is. Yeah. Well, good interview, Bob. Thanks for, uh, to Ian for being on, on the, uh, Knife Junkie podcast as well. A lot of, a uh, lot of interesting stuff there. And uh, don't forget, uh, we appreciate you listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you have any questions, maybe a question or comment for Ian, we'll be glad to pass that along and maybe try to get him back on to answer. But uh, call our listener line at 724-466-4487. That's 724-466-4487. And uh, give us any questions, comments, or whatever, and let us know on the uh, listener line. Bob, uh, you and Ian, final thoughts, final words. Uh, Ian, any final thoughts? Just uh, get out there, find somebody to train with. Um, we got, you know, we, we live in an era now that, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, instructional videos on YouTube. Um, I can uh, give Bob actually a list of people I would recommend watching. There's oh, a lot okay. of good people out we'll there. We'll put that up on the nice And uh, each one of the people that I will recommend will kind of give you a little different take on, uh, because nobody knows everything. Right. There's always a different experience that somebody had that made, makes them think a different way. So, me as an instructor to spread out to, to give knowledge to my students as I train with a lot of people and I kind of put it together in my own way, but also in the way that they showed me. Right. And, you know, so I'd recommend people like uh, Fred Mastro, um, Paul Bunak, uh, a guy named Michael Janich oh, yeah. of uh, Marshall Blade Concepts. Yeah, the guy who it, designed the Yojimbo 2. The Yojimbo 2, yes. And uh, there's now actually a trainer for that as well. Cool. Um, I have to get that. And uh, that's a very good um, uh, let's, how do I say this lawful system? It, it, uh, it goes into, it really goes into the self-defense laws okay. in terms of using a knife and how you can follow up and the targeting without actually killing the person. And there's this whole, whole moral thing. Yeah, there is a moral yes. thing that comes with it. Yeah. <laughs> whole moral thing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I guess, I guess, um, I, I got nothing I to say after that. Yeah, I'm just uh, great. I'm just uh, glad to have these people around me. <laughs> that's right. right that's Jim. right. Thank, thanks, uh, Bob. Thanks, Ian. And thank you for joining us on the uh, Knife Junkie podcast. And be sure to visit the website, thenifejunkie.com. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.